What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about heart sounds and heart murmurs. Again, this is going to be part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, it helps you. Please support us. One of the ways that you can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. Another thing, down in the description box below, we have a link to our website. On there, you'll find a lot of great stuff. We got notes, we got illustrations. We're developing exam prep courses for those of you taking the step one, the step two, the pans, etc. And we have some nerd and engineer merchandise that I you know, think you guys should check out as well. All right, without further ado, let's start talking about heart sounds and heart murmurs. When we talk about these, I think it's really important for your exams and also for the clinical world to be able to understand normal heart sounds. When there's some extra heart sounds like S3 and S4, and if you really wanna to go to the advanced level, if you're planning to go into cardiology, then I could say, well, let's talk about the splitting of the S2. All right, so first things first, real basic stuff here. S1, S2 heart sounds, these are the normal heart sounds. So S1, which we're gonna represent on this graph with the time on the x-axis, is gonna be this guy here. This is our S1. S1 is going to represent two things. One is it's going to represent the closure of one of the valves, which is going to be the mitral valve. So the mitral valve should close, because what happens is, as the pressure inside the ventricles rise and it tries to push blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta, it should close the mitral valve. Same concept as blood is going from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, it should open the pulmonary valves but close the tricuspid valves. So for S1, it should be the closure of the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve should close and then subsequently, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve should open. That's the basic concept behind that, but the sound is the closure of these valves. S2 is the opposite. So blood has already exited the left ventricle and the right ventricle. It fills the pulmonary artery and fills the aorta. What happens is during diastole, some of the blood will try to recoil. We don't want it to go back into the left ventricle. So we should close the aortic valve. Same concept. Blood from the pulmonary artery will want to kind of fall back into the right ventricle, but it shouldn't be able to go back into the right ventricle because of the pulmonary valve should snap shut. So whenever these two valves snap shut, that is the S2 heart sound. So it'd be the aortic, we're gonna put a little O there, aortic valve closing, and the pulmonary valve will also close. One important thing to remember though is that the aortic side, it's the pressure is really kind of high. And so naturally, the, the actual aortic valve should close quicker than the actual pulmonary valve should. So sometimes we represent this S2 as two parts. We represent an A2, which is the second heart sound, which is the closure of the aortic valve and pulmonary valve, but particularly the aortic component. And then the other component here is the P2, which is the pulmonary valve closing, which is a component of the S2. But both of these make up the S2, okay? All right, that's the basics. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna add in some sounds and talk about the splitting of the aortic and the pulmonary valve sounds for the S2. Let's come to the S3 and S4. So S3 and S4 are interesting sounds. They're extra heart sounds. So now we should know that you'll have an S1, and then you'll have this A2 and P2. So we're gonna put S1, and we're gonna put A2 and P2. That's the S2 heart sound though. You add another heart sound in this, which we're gonna talk about is S3. S3, the concept behind this is there's left ventricular dilation. That's the words I want you to remember. There's left ventricular dilation. So these ventricles are gargantuous. And so what happens is the actual left ventricle can easily fill. They actually rapidly fill with blood. And as they rapidly fill, the blood bounces off the walls of the ventricles as it starts to distend, and it creates this turbulence of blood flow, which tr triggers a murmur. That is, that turbulence of blood flow within the super dilated, rapidly filled uh, ventricles is the S3 heart sound. So again, just to recap it, it's going to be rapid ventricular, we're gonna put in this case left ventricular, filling, which creates a massive turbulence of blood flow within the left ventricle, and you could say the right ventricle and that is what precipitates the actual extra heart sound. All right, so that is going to be the S3. So this will precipitate what sound? 
the S3. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, what's the reason for the rapid left ventricular filling? Super dilated ventricles. What are some causes of dilated ventricles? CHF, which one? Systolic heart failure. So one cause would be systolic heart failure. The other one would be dilated cardiomyopathy would be another really, really big one. This can happen not just pathologically, but physiologically. Sometimes in patients who are super young and healthy athletes, they can have dilated ventricles so they can, they can trigger super large stroke volumes. So you can see this as well in young athletes. So these are the concepts that I want you guys to understand as the causes, whether it be pathological or physiological, of the S3. So we know that it's during the filling process. So that means that these valves are open. The mitral valve and the tricuspid valve are open. So if those are open, it can't be after the S1, it's gotta be after the S2, because they're closed from S1 all the way to S2. During S2, after that, they open up a little bit again. So the sound would have to be right here and have to be very early. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in this extra sound here. We'll do it here, where there's gonna be a sound that comes right after this, and this is going to be the S3. So you'd have S1, the S2, which is the combination of these, and then right afterwards, the S3, if you have systolic heart failure, dilated cardiomyopathy, or very young, healthy athletes. Let's come to this next one. So S4 heart sound, what do you notice the difference between the ventricles here? Thin, super dilated ventricles, thick ventricles. So whenever you have a very rigid left ventricle, it actually will do what? It will decrease ventricular filling. And if you decrease the ventricular filling process, what this does is this causes the atria to have to generate a very high pressure. And so the atria will contract super late. So you develop a late atrial contraction because the atria are gonna have to really, really work very hard to push blood from the atria and the ventricles because of the super high pressure in the ventricles and how poor their filling process is. So again, rigid left ventricle, will decrease the ventricular filling. That'll make it really hard to get blood into the ventricle, so then the atria has to contract and very powerfully. And when it does, it generates the S4 heart sound. So the S4 heart sound is usually the result of the atria super working hard to contract and squeeze blood down. So it goes hard to get blood in. Whenever that happens and it makes it difficult to get blood in, the atria will then pound on the remaining blood in the atria to squeeze it down into the left ventricle. That is referred to as the S4 heart sound, but it comes later. So it has to go S1, A2, P2, which is your S2, and then in comparison to S3, S3 will come right afterwards if you have a dilated rapidly filled ventricle. For S4, it has to come a lot later because now the atria have to contract to push the remaining amount down. So this would be your S4, and S3 will be somewhere in here as comparing the two. So now we've compared S3 and S4. The question comes is what's causing this rigid left ventricle to not fill? Diastolic heart failure. That would be a big one where they're super, super kind of hypertrophic and very poor at being able to fill. Another one is anything that causes left ventricular hypertrophy. What are two things that cause left ventricular hypertrophy? Aortic stenosis, this will definitely precipitate left ventricular hypertrophy. And if you hypertrophy this, can you feel it? No, it's a very small space. And the last one is chronic hypertension. This will also precipitate left ventricular hypertrophy. So these are the things that I want you guys to remember for the causes of an S4 heart sound. Okay, beautiful. At this point, we've covered normal S1, S2. We've covered what happens when you have a dilated, rapidly filling, turbulent left ventricle and what happens when you have a rigid left ventricle with poor ventricular filling and the atria have to contract to push the remaining blood down, S3, S4 accordingly. Now, if you're a cardiologist level, <laughs> you got like that insane uh, stethoscope in the ears of an eagle, I guess, and you can really, really pick up on some of these things. Sure, we can talk about the splitting of the S2. The concept behind this is, is when you have a patient who's, let's say, we're in two phases, so one, is we're gonna say that the patient is particularly having an inspiration, and an, actually let's do it like this. Let's say expiration first and inspiration later. So expiration first, inspiration later. What happens is you have that S1, 
and then you have again the S2, which is the A2 and the P2. Naturally, in normal people, it should go A2, and it should go P P2, and they should be really hard to be able to differentiate one another on the expiration. But let's say that the person decides to take a deep breath in. When they take a deep breath in, what happens is you massively fill the right ventricle because your intrathoracic pressure drops, and if you fill the right ventricle, this thing is gonna get overfilled more than usual during expiration. If it's overfilled, it now has to push a larger volume of blood than it usually does out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery during systole and then during diastole come back and snap it shut. If it has to deal with more blood than it usually has to, what do you think is gonna to happen to that sound? Is it gonna come a little bit earlier, later, stay the same? It's gonna push it a lot more. It's gonna come later. So what happens is, is you have something called the S1 the A2 will stay there, but the P2 will just extend out a little bit more. And that'll only happen during inspiration. Why? Because of increased uh, filling. So because of increased right side venous return. The heart is on the right is gonna have to deal with more blood during inspiration than it usually does during expiration. And that's the concept behind this, okay? So physiological, Split S2 is a physiological thing. So the cause is usually, it's due to respirophasic changes. Is that special way of explaining that the S2 can split during inspiration as compared to expiration. That's all it is. Okay, cool. Now we move on to the next concept of a split S2. A wide split S2. So this one's weird. And what happens with this one is the patient usually has, again, their S1 is the same, no change there. But what you'll notice is, is that their actual, again, aortic sound and pulmonary sound appear, again, farther away during expiration, but during inspiration, they appear even farther. So here, that's really hard to differentiate in physiologically split, split S2. But in a wide split S2, you can actually differentiate the A2 and P2 in both expiration and inspiration. So now we have to ask ourselves the question, why am I able to hear the splitting of the S2 in both expiration and inspiration compared to the physiologic one? And that's because the right ventricle is being overloaded constantly or it's having a hard time getting blood out of the right heart in general. So let me explain something. Let's say that a patient has something called Let's say a right bundle branch block. Let's say that they have a pulmonary hypertension where their uh, pulmonary artery pressures are super high. And it's really hard in both of these scenarios. If I have a right bundle branch block, this right ventricle is not going to contract on time. It's gonna delay the time of contraction. The other thing, is if I have pulmonary artery hypertension, it's gonna be harder for the right ventricle to generate enough pressure to push blood out into the pulmonary artery. That's gonna delay the time to get blood out. If I either delay the blood getting out of the right ventricle, that'll cause the pulmonary sound to come later in general expiration, but then make it worse. Take a deep breath in. You take a deep breath in and now your right heart venous return is gonna increase. Now you give the right heart that's already struggling to get blood out even more blood and it's gonna make it even longer. So that's the concept here is that you're actually extending this during inspiration but it's still present during expiration. What's the reason why behind this? <laughs> the reason why is, is again, you're increasing the right venous return in a strained right heart. And if you overload that right heart, it's gonna make it even harder to get, take a longer time to get blood out of the right ventricle. That's the concept here. So for a wide split S2, think about right heart diseases, right bundle branch block, pulmonary hypertension, anything that is delaying the transit of blood out of the right ventricle. All right, fixed split S2. This one's actually super, super cool. And I only want you to remember one of these, but what happens in this one is again, you're gonna notice S1, S1 is not changing, but what you're gonna notice here is, watch this, this is actually kinda cool. There is a splitting of the S2, the A2 and P2 component, during expiration, but it is, if I can do this perfect, 
exactly the same length apart. So now, this one, it went from, there's a split to holy crap there's a split. From here there's a split and the split's the same. All right, no split to a split. Split to holy crap there's a big split. And split, split, same. What in the heck is causing the split to be the exact same during both expiration and both inspiration? Okay, good question. The primary cause is something called an atrial septal defect. That is it. There is other ones, but this is gonna be the one that you'll most likely see on your exam. What happens is, during expiration, the pressure in the left heart is higher than the pressure in the right heart. So what will it do? It'll shunt blood into the right heart, filling it with a good amount of blood. So you're gonna fill this right heart with blood, and if it's gonna fill, it's gonna take a little bit of a longer time to be able to squeeze that blood out of the right heart into the pulmonary artery and eventually close the pulmonary valve in comparison to the aortic valve. During inspiration, what happens to the venous return to the right heart? It increases because you're pulling blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, filling the right heart with blood, giving it more blood to have to deal with, a longer transit time between the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery and eventually shutting the valve. So what you'll notice is, is that the right heart venous return is fixed. That's the cool thing about this, is that there is a right venous return that is fixed during both inspiration and expiration. And what I mean by that is, is that in this patient, they're having blood coming from the left atrium to the right atrium during expiration because left atrial pressures are higher. And that the blood coming from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava going into the right atrium is occurring because of inspiration dropping the intrathoracic pressure. But the venous return to the right heart is constant during inspiration and expiration. That's the cool concept here. And it's because there's a hole allowing for the equalization of blood flow because of the ASD. That's the cool concept. All right, let's come to the last one here, which is a paradoxical split S2. So this one's really kind of a wonky one. What happens here is, again, you have that S1. That's going to be the constant thing that you'll notice out of all of these. Uh, this is the same. But here's what's really cool. You have the P2 that comes first. And then the A2 comes after. And you're like, wait a second, I thought that it always was A2P2. Yeah, this is why it's weird. It's wonky, right? And the same thing during inspiration, you'll notice that the P2 is still coming before the A2. It's just, it's just a little bit closer. So what you'll notice is you'll notice a reverse, kind of of the reversal of the roles of these two, right? And you'll notice that it's wider during expiration and less wide during inspiration. Let's dive into this, okay. So the only reason that the P2 would come before is because the left ventricle was taking probably a super long time to get blood out of it. That's what was the common theme out of all of these before. The reason why the P2 was becoming later, or whatever it may be, is because it was taking a longer time for the right heart to get blood out. So if the A2 is coming later, it's because it's taking a long time to get blood out. That's the whole concept. So there has to be a delay in left ventricular expulsion of blood. And therefore, if there's a delay in the left ventricular expulsion, there'll be a delay in the closure of the aortic valve and pulmonary valve of blood. So we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, what's causing this? Well, one is we're having a hard time getting blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta. This part is not occurring very well. What was the problem in this one? It was because the, left, the right bundle branch was actually uh, blocked. Well, what if the left bundle branch is blocked? Wouldn't that cause a delay in the left ventricular depolarization and contraction? Yeah. So a left bundle branch block would be one particular reason. The other one was that if a patient had like chronic hypertension, right? So if they have pulmonary hypertension, same thing. Anything that causes the afterload to be super, super high. So usually this would be things like aortic stenosis would be a really, really big one. So aortic stenosis is a really one important one to remember. Oh, um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where the septum is so thick and chunky that it blocks the blood flow out of the left ventricle. That would be another one that delays the blood flow. And again, you could definitely add in systemic hypertension as well. So we could add in systemic hypertension. That's also going to be this one as well. So all of these could definitely lead to the left ventricle 
having a harder time to get blood out of it, delaying the blood flow getting out, and then subsequently delaying the closure of the aortic valve. And that's why it comes later. Question is, is in all of these, we notice that during inspiration, it increased that space between the two. Why is it increased in expiration and decreased in inspiration? Well, let's kind of use logic here. During the process of expiration, more blood flow is coming to which side of the heart? To the left heart. So it'll get filled with more blood. It's gonna make it harder to be able to get blood out already. Now add more blood, it's gonna delay the actual process even more. Inspiration, you're doing what to the heart? You're increasing right side venous return. If you increase right side venous return, now the right heart is gonna have a little bit more of a struggle to get blood out of it, because it's gonna have to deal with more blood. So that should cause the P2 to come a little bit closer to the A2, because now it has to deal with a larger volume of blood. Expiration, left ventricle has to deal with more blood. Inspiration, right ventricle has to deal with more blood. That's why it just gets a little bit shorter during inspiration. Super cool, right? All right, that covers the heart sounds. Now let's talk about heart murmurs. All right, my friends, so now we have to talk about murmurs. When a patient has a heart murmur, right, so you've gone through, you've said, okay, let me auscultate. I hear S1, I hear S2. I don't hear any S3, S4, no real weird splitting of the S2. But here's something super odd in a particular area. One of the first things that you have to do is know where you're supposed to be auscultating. First thing, where's the murmur that we actually auscultate? So we go there, we grab our stethoscope, and we say, oh, right second aortic space, the aortic area. That could be associated with aortic stenosis, so start thinking about that right away. Second intercostal space on the left side, pulmonic area. Think about pulmonic valve diseases. Left third intercostal space, think about aortic regurgitation and HCM. Left fourth intercostal space, tricuspid area, think about a VSD. Left fifth intercostal space, usually on the midclavicular line, think about any mitral valve disease, stenosis, regurgitation, and prolapse. So right away, if you hear those locations, think about the possible types of diseases that you will actually have occurring there. So once you've gone through each particular location and you hear a murmur, let's say that you hear a murmur in a particular location, then you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is it a systolic, diastolic, or continuous murmur? That's important. So we're going to go through that now. For systolic murmurs, you are hearing it between S1 and S2. So when you listen to these, you want to be able to use the particular terminologies of how they describe like the quality of the murmur or the characteristics of the murmur. When you hear a murmur, that's referred to as a crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur. This is two uh, typically two particular types of pathologies that are usually classic of what we call a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. So it sounds really loud initially, and then it decreases in intensity as you go on. Two particular murmurs. One is there's a pathology with the aortic valve. So we refer to this one as aortic stenosis. So in aortic stenosis, what happens is, is it's really hard for blood to be able to get from the left ventricle out into the aorta. And what happens is, is blood is trying to move through this area, it kind of like bends these valves a little bit, and it kind of bows them. And when it bows them, it produces this click. And that's usually one differentiating factor between these two types of murmurs, is you'll hear like this what's called an ejection click, and then a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. That's classic for aortic stenosis. The other thing is that this murmur is usually right upper sternal border, so that right second intercostal space, and it radiates usually to the carotids. And that's another particular thing that you can help to differentiate between this next one that I'm gonna talk about. This other one is crescendo decrescendo, but it doesn't have an ejection click. This one is usually due to the left ventricular outflow tract being super, super narrow and obstructed. This is called hypertrophic, and sometimes they insert in the O, obstructive, but I'm gonna put hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's a type of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And what happens is it is really hard for blood to squeeze through this tiny little area from the left ventricle and into the aorta, but there's nothing that's actually causing a valve to bow or bend or anything like that that precipitates this click. So there's no click, but it is louder in the beginning and decreases as you go throughout systole. This one though, again, usually heard particularly around, uh, for the most part, usually kind of like herbs point is the common area for this one. So you usually hear this around herbs, 
point, and this one doesn't usually have any radiation to the carotids. So that's one real big thing. So that's how you're gonna differentiate these two types of murmurs, location, timing, and maybe some extra heart sounds and radiation. Okay, cool. The next one here is it's not a crescendo, so let's actually mod, like, like denote that. It's a crescendo, decrescendo, crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Another big thing here is we have another one, and this murmur is super interesting. What happens is, is you hear a murmur sometimes, and it's usually pretty like, it, it doesn't change in intensity throughout the systolic process. But usually what happens is, is blood and this disease will normally during systole, you're supposed to pump blood out this way, but there's a defect within this valve. And this valve is supposed to block, the mitral valve is supposed to block blood from going back into left atria. What happens is the valve buckles and it bends. And when it bends, it opens up this opportunity for blood to kind of squirt back here into the left atrium, which produces this regurgitation. But you'll hear this click sound that actually comes about right before the actual murmur takes place. And so this is called a ejection click. And then this one right here, this is called, we're gonna put holo, a holo systolic murmur. Usually what that refers to is it means that you hear it throughout the entire process of systole, but it's not technically the case because it depends upon where the ejection click occurs. So sometimes this ejection click can move. So it can occur earlier, and usually scenarios where the patient is super, let's say having a very low venous return, um, or it can come a lot later if you increase their venous return. So we'll talk about maneuvers that affect that later. All right, but that's the concept here. Now if you look at these other two, if we come down here, same concept here. So again, we're gonna have a patient here who has what's called a mitral valve prolapse. So we'll say this one is a mitral valve prolapse. They may have a regurgitating murmur associated with it. Another patient may have the same thing, but this may again occur throughout the entire, so this is truly what we refer to as more of a holo systolic murmur. So we're gonna put here again, this is definitely more classic of what we would use that term of holosystolic, you're hearing it throughout the entire process. Sometimes they say pan-systolic, holosystolic, same thing. But it's occurring between S1 and S2 continuously. This is because during systole, blood is supposed to go from the left ventricle into the aorta. But all this blood during the immediate part of systole floods right back into the left atria. This is true mitral regurgitation. So if a patient has mitral regurgitation, there will be no click unless they have a prolapse of the actual valve and then regurgitation, all right? Big thing to remember is both of these can be heard at the apex. This one has a click, this one does not have a click, but it also can be heard at the apex. The other thing is that this usually radiates. It radiates and if you listen at the fifth intercostal space, you go over here, you may be able to hear it in the axilla. So sometimes this may also radiate to the axilla. So that's one way that you can help to differentiate between these two but then there's one more. Another one is where you again can hear this murmur and it appears to sound holosystolic or pansystolic. So you hear it throughout the entire systolic process. This one is again, when we say holosystolic, it's because of a VSD. So we had mitral valve prolapse, mitral regurgitation, and what's called a VSD. Now, the VSD is usually particularly heard more likely um, around that fourth intercostal space. So if you really wanted to, you could add that you'll hear this on the left, fourth intercostal space. But what happens is the moment systole occurs, blood is supposed to go from the left ventricle into the aorta. The blood will jet over here into the right ventricle. So the smaller the hole is, the louder the murmur is generally. The larger the hole, the softer the murmur is. And that's just because of like the actual turbulence of blood flow. But in that concept here, whenever this happens, it's gonna be out throughout the entire systolic process. One of the big things is location, all right? That's gonna be one of the key things here. And we'll also talk about maneuvers. So this is the ways that I want you guys to think about a systolic murmur. is occurring between S1, occurring between S2. Think about location, think about extra heart sounds added on and think about radiation. And then again, use your terminologies to differentiate the quality or characteristic of the murmur.
All right, cool deal. One quick thing before we move on. I mentioned pretty much all left heart murmurs, right? It doesn't seem like I mentioned many right heart murmurs. The reason why is left is the ones that we're more concerned with, right are less common, plus guess what? Aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis will have the same type of quality of murmur. It'll just be a different location. Mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation will have the same type of murmur. It'll just be a different location. And so that's the big things to be able to understand the difference about. All right, cool, diastolic murmurs. What does that mean? That means that these murmurs are occurring between S2 and S1. It's occurring after diastole, or during diastole, I should say. So in this particular scenario, we don't have any murmur between S1 and S2. It's coming after S2. This one's interesting. What happens in this one is you'll hear this murmur, and it'll be the same between these two. They'll look exactly the same in configuration. And it looks like it's decreasing in intensity as you go throughout diastole, right? This is called a decrescendo type of murmur, all right? What's the difference between these two? All right, in this one, the patient has what's called aortic regurgitation. And again, it'd be the same concept if they had pulmonary regurgitation. They would have a decrescendo murmur. In this particular scenario, blood will be jetting backwards during diastole, blood's supposed to come back, but it gets blocked by the aortic valve. If the aortic valve is damaged, it'll jet back in and precipitate turbulence of blood flow, precipitate a murmur. In this scenario, for aortic regurgitation, where would you generally hear this? It's usually around that left uh, you know, third intercostal space. We refer to this as herbs point. So you should be able to hear this around herbs point. Right? If it was pulmonic regurgitation, it'd be a little bit different, right? So that's usually around like, again, usually more of like that left uh, second intercostal space rather than the left third intercostal space. So now that's one particular point. The next thing here is that in this other disease, <laughs> this is mitral stenosis. So this is called mitral stenosis. What happens in mitral stenosis is this valve is so stenotic and it's really difficult to get blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle, super difficult. And what happens is, is as you're trying to push blood through here, these valves will start to kind of like buckle, if you will. And they kind of buckle at a certain point, which kind of gives them this weird sound as you're trying to squeeze blood through this small area here. They precipitate a kind of a clicking sound or a snapping sound. And that happens right here before the decrescendo murmur. You know what they call this? An opening snap. We're gonna put O-S. So you'll hear this opening snap at the apex of the heart, then a decrescendo murmur that comes after that one. That's classic of mitral stenosis. So if I say opening snap, decrescendo murmur, apex, mitral stenosis. If I said herbs point, a decrescendo murmur that was auscultated, you would say this is a aortic regurgitation type of murmur. All right, so we got these down. Same concept would exist if I were to say different location for pulmonic regurgitation, different location for tricuspid stenosis, but same type of quality characteristics of the murmur and same timing of the murmur. We come down to the last one. The last type of murmur here is gonna be a continuous murmur. This is usually seen in the pediatric population. What happens with this one is that they have this murmur that usually is occurring between S1 and S2 and continues after S2. And the characteristic terminology behind this one is continuous, but they add in something. It's machine-like. So it sounds like it's a machine-like murmur. And whenever you hear that terminology, you wanna think about a particular disorder called a PDA, a patent ductus arteriosus. What's happening in this particular murmur is blood is supposed to move left ventricle into the aorta and flow through the aorta. But the left side heart pressures are generally higher than the right heart pressures in ba babies that are already born. So naturally, where will this blood flow? It'll flow this way during systole. Then the heart will go into diastole. So blood is supposed to kind of flow back, shut that aortic valve closed. But what do you think about the aortic pressures during diastole in comparison to the pulmonary pressures during diastole? It's still higher. So regardless, blood will keep shunting from the aorta into the pulmonary artery during both systole and diastole. That's why it's continuous.
But one of the weird things is that this one is usually located around what's called the left infraclavicular area. So this one is not a part of that classic locations that we uh, kind of annotated prior. So this is the way that we would define murmurs in a very simple concept. Auscultate the locations. Remember, ape TM, right? From there, oh, you hear a murmur? What is the timing? Is it systolic? If it's systolic, is it crescendo decrescendo? Or is it holo? Does it have a click before? Or does it not have a click? Where is it again, location, and does it radiate? That should help you. Oh, it's not systolic, it's diastolic. Okay, does it have a decrescendo pattern? Oh, it does. Does it have an uh, opening snap that comes before or not? And what's the location? That's the key ways of differentiating. And lastly, is it a continuous one? Usually continuous one is the easiest one to be able to pick out because it's the only one we have here, and that's usually associated with PDA. From there, if you're still stuck with saying, I don't really know the type of actual murmur it is, then we can come to the big daddy. We say, okay, I'm struggling between de determining what kind of murmur this is. I'm gonna do specific maneuvers to see if I can increase the intensity or decrease the intensity of the murmur, and that may add to my confidence that this is the type of murmur. And if after all of that you're still not sure, the classic thing that we usually go to is an echocardiogram to really define the type of murmur. All right, let's start talking about the maneuvers now to determine the type of murmur. We get to the point where we say, okay, location, it's systolic versus diastolic. Then we can say, what is actually happening if I do this particular position change? This is really important to memorize. One, inspiration. Any right side murmur, we didn't talk about the right side murmurs here because they're not commonly tested, but it's the same exact concept. Any right side murmur will be increased in intensity during inspiration because you're increasing the right side venous return. Any left-sided murmur would be decreased because you're not improving the venous return on that side. That would be a one helpful sign. Expiration, you're increasing the left side venous return and decreasing the right side venous return. So the right-sided murmurs will be decreased with expiration and left side murmurs increased with expiration. Straightforward. If I lean forward, it brings the aortic valve closer to the chest wall. So it'll increase the intensity of all aortic murmurs. If I have them in the lateral decubitus position, so I lay them on their left side and I listen there, it'll bring the mitral valve closer to the chest wall. So it'll increase the intensity of all mitral valve murmurs. Here's the big stuff. If I increase venous return, I have them squat, I, have, I lift their legs up. I'm increasing the venous return to the heart. Increasing venous return will increase the intensity of all murmurs except two. It'll increase the intensity of all murmurs except two, which are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and mitral valve prolapse. It'll bring the, the actual mitral valve prolapse, remember there's a click and then a murmur. It'll bring the click later and make the murmur shorter. And it'll also decrease the intensity of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy murmur. If you do the opposite here, which is decrease the venous return, you valzava, which increases the intrathoracic pressure and reduces venous return, or you stand, which reduces venous return. That'll decrease the intensity of all murmurs except what? Mitral valve prolapse and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In this, it'll actually increase the intensity of HCM. And then what it'll do is, in this scenario here, for mitral valve prolapse, you have to think about it. It's actually gonna cause the click to come earlier and then the actual murmur after that to be much longer. And that's the big thing to remember. Okay, next one is afterload. When you increase afterload, you're, you're squeezing these hand grips. And what this will do is, this will increase the intensity of an aortic regurgitation murmur and mitral regurgitation murmur. And it'll decrease the intensity of an aortic stenosis, mitral valve prolapse, and HCM murmur. For decreasing afterload, this is gonna be using things like amyl nitrate and it's super short acting and it'll dilate the vessels. If it dilates them, it's gonna do the opposite. It's gonna decrease the aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation murmur and increase the aortic stenosis and mitral valve prolapse and HCM murmur. The whole concept behind this is if you increase afterload, the pressure inside of the aorta, it's gonna shoot blood back into the actual ventricle and also make it easier for blood to fly back into the left atrium. That's why it'll increase these murmurs. If you decrease the afterload, the blood won't be shooting back into the ventricle and shooting back into the atria. That's why it decreases in this uh, types of murmurs. For aortic stenosis, mitral valve prolapse, and HCM, 
Again, if you increase the afterload here, what you're doing is you're making it harder for blood to leave the left ventricle and move out into the aorta. That's gonna decrease the flow across the aortic semilunar valve, decreasing aortic stenosis. It'll decrease the buckling of the mitral valve, decreasing that click and the murmur. And also, it'll actually help because what it'll do is, when you increase afterload, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it keeps more blood in the left ventricle and stretches out the left ventricle and flattens out that septum and reduces the obstruction there in HCM. But that's the concepts I need you guys to remember. All right, my friends, we covered aortic diseases. I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.